All right, everybody, I think we're going to get started here. So grab your pizza. Uh, please sign in if you haven't. Find a comfortable chair, all that good stuff. Um, all right, everybody. Uh, welcome to the inaugural CU Prime seminar of the spring 2018 semester. Uh, my name is Charlie. I'm a member of CU Prime. I'm a fourth year grad student in physics here. I work over in Chile, which is the building that's attached to the way. Um, so for those of you who have not been to a CU Prime seminar before or don't know what CU Prime is, CU Prime is a student-run organization here in the physics department, but we're slowly branching out to engineering and chemistry, um, that seeks to uh, increase the inclusiveness uh, in science for all groups. And we do this by um, a number of different programs, but sort of they all are based around sort of creating a sense of community within the department, creating opportunities for undergraduates, grad students, postdocs to connect, connect with each other, and uh, hopefully just at least, you know, know each other's names. <laughs> um, so before we get started, um, or the, so the CU Prime talk, sorry, which is what you are at here today, is a seminar that's a little bit different than most uh, other physics seminars or science seminars you might have been to and that these talks are actually tailored for an undergraduate audience. Our hope is that someone in Physics 1110, 1120 can come away with a pretty good understanding of uh, the material that's presented here and not only have an understanding of the material, but we also ask our speakers to talk a little bit about what life is like as a graduate student. So we hope you get a little sense of what it actually means to do this type of research, whatever it may be. Um, just a, a little, um, Note about something that happened earlier this week. So CU Prime makes uh, flyers to advertise these talks. Hopefully you all have seen these flyers. Maybe they have brought some of you to these talks uh, in the past, maybe they did this week. Um, and this week we created a flyer and it had a uh, internet meme on it that really uh, sort of went against some of the principles of CU Prime. It, it reinforced some stereotypes that we're really trying to work against. And it was an oversight on us as an organization put that out. Um, this was brought to our attention by members of the student community, and we cannot thank you enough for bringing that to our attention. We've since corrected it, um, changed the flyers, rehung them. Um, but if you have any issues with this, please come talk to me after the uh, seminar. And I and C. Brian as an organization uh, really apologize and thank you all for uh, letting us know. So um, moving on to the speaker, or to the talk at hand. Um, this week, we are sort of kicking things off with a uh, trip down to the land of experimental atomic, molecular, and optical physics, which is something that CU is really well known for. That building, Gila, is almost entirely dedicated to the study of this subfield of physics. Um, so the speaker today actually works with me and my group, the Captain Renan group, but he does stuff that is, I don't even understand, so he's going to tell us all about it. Um, he's actually uh, a graduate student in the chemistry department, and he does physical chemistry? Chemical physics. Chemical right? physics. I always mess it up. Um, but I've been, I've been rambling long enough, so please help me welcome Kevin Dory. Uh, thanks, for the uh, thanks, everyone, for coming to a physics lecture at like 5 p.m. on Wednesday. That sounds absolutely horrible. Um, but like I said, my name's Kevin. I work in the same group as Charlie, and we work in a deep, dark dungeon down in Gilla, so we never really see the daylight too often. But we do get to see tons of light from our lasers that we use all the time. And uh, this is an actual lab photo, too, if you're curious about what goes on um, in the lab on a day-to-day -day basis. So before we start, uh, it's probably a good idea since we're all students and stuff like that, we're all building our journeys in life with, it's good to hear how people build their own story, and uh, not necessarily how they build it, but how the pieces fall into place. And so, for me, um, I grew up in a small redneck town um, just outside of Dayton, Ohio, that's actually so small, I couldn't find any internet pictures of it. I could only find like, houses for sale and stuff like that. So um, suffice to say, this is kind of what Ohio looks like. It's very green, very humid, lots of farms, lots of corn and stuff like that. And before I came here, when I was a little less sleep deprived and a little more tolerant of alcohol, I went to a university called Wright State University, um, which was a primarily commuter school with not many grad programs and things like that. And I swear to God, that's not a pentagram. I don't know where they got that design. Uh, but the big question is like, I'm here, right? So how did I take Dayton, Ohio, and turn that into Boulder, Colorado? And how did I take 
this commuter school in uh, the middle of a redneck town in Ohio and turn it into the University of Colorado Boulder? And how do I take those pesky cornfields and turn them into something a little bit more fun, like ski slopes and mountains? And so we'll jump ahead a little bit um, because you don't really want to hear about my childhood. But before I came here, I, like I said, I started and I went to a school called Wright State University. And I went there for my undergrad degrees. I got degrees in biology and chemistry and mostly in bartending. After that, I was on a straight and narrow path, like a lot of people are, um, to go straight to med school. Uh, I was going to be a biology major, I was going to go be a doctor, I was going to join some of the least stressed and happiest people on the planet by going to med school. Um, and a lot of times if you're going down a career path, sometimes you don't want to, especially in college, you don't really have a lot of time with all the busy, busy things you have to do to think if this is really right for you. And it wasn't until my senior year, I had about a quarter left of my undergrad degrees, that I realized that med school wasn't really for me. I uh, did some interviews, went to a couple colleges, and it just <coughs> wasn't going to suit my personality well. So I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I kind of bartended for a little bit, and it was getting towards the end of my senior year, and one of my professors in chemistry said, hey, you ever thought about grad school? And I was like, no, I'm not a nerd, dude. Turns out I'm a really big nerd. And so I took a hard right down to grad school. And uh, when I was in grad school, I actually got my master's back home because I hadn't done any undergrad research or anything like that, so PhDs just didn't even bother to look at me. And I worked on a project called Surface Enhanced Raman Spectroscopy, and that's not the noodles, it's a type of laser spectroscopy. And so what we would do is we take nanoparticles, sandwich them together, and we put a small molecule in there, like sometimes DNA, protein, sometimes chemical warfare agents, fun things like that. And if we shine a laser onto it and collect the light in just the right way, we'd get a little graph that was very indicative of what was there, and we could actually detect single molecules. And so I got pretty interested in lasers and things like that. And as I was finishing up my master's, uh, I was able to do that in 2014 with about as much enthusiasm as I uh, took to bartending. And after that, I was like, oh, well, all right, I'm there. I'll do more. I'll go to a PhD. Well, not really. Kind of went and bartended for a little bit more because I kind of liked it and I wanted the summer off. But after that summer, I eventually found myself here in Boulder working in that very tall building, Jilla, which is right next door to us. And actually, these smaller buildings are part of it as well. And now I work in a deep dark dungeon doing hardcore laser physics research with uh, a few lab mates um, that get to tolerate me on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, okay, so like grad school in uh, kind of like a 30-year-old college student almost, something like that, is it really worth it? And yeah, it really is. Uh, you get unparalleled experiences here that you wouldn't be able to get in a lot of other jobs or a lot of education settings. We get to work with multi-million dollar laser systems every day. It's like a miracle they even trust us to touch these things. We also get to work with stuff that looks straight out of sci-fi. That's an actual real picture of a, and that's just something we do to develop a mirror in our labs. That's uh, not even one of the bigger projects we do, and it looks like, yeah, it looks like something out of Avatar. We also get training in the machine shop so we can get hands-on experience building our own tools and literally making yourself a part of the experiment with the blood, sweat, tears, and grease. And it's a little exhausting from time to time, uh, but you get to meet really cool people in really cool areas of the world that I'd never be able to afford to go to as a young college student and see things and experience different cultures and ideas that just I wouldn't be open to if I wasn't doing this. And so this is an example of um, a typical day-to-day -day in the lab. This is uh, something that we do every day, almost every day, to see how our laser's running. And it's kind of fun. So what I want you to notice is this is our laser. This is a power meter. It's measuring the power of our laser. And see, that's like 9 watts, right? That's like a bad light bulb. And so I'll talk about our lasers being really strong, but 9 watts doesn't seem very strong. And so if you pay attention to this little optic here, that's just a lens, our 9 watt laser is actually powerful enough to make an own, its own miniature sun in the lab. We're focusing the light down so tight, it's so intense, it's ionizing air, and it's creating its own sun. And all these colors you're seeing are different processes of the laser interacting with the air. There's actually a little bit of aurora borealis and stuff like that in there. And that's just something we get to do, I don't know, for fun if we're bored, or if we think the laser isn't putting out as much energy um, as it should. And so, of course, uh, none of everything that I just told you about would be possible without support from an incredible group of people. And this is the, uh, the Captain Renan group that Charlie and I work in, and there's, uh, uh, this isn't even all of us here, I don't think. And Margaret and Henry are our advisors. They're kind of hiding there in the back, and they're really the ones that give us the opportunity to kind of pursue the ideas that we have, to try new things, and to not be afraid of falling flat on our face, even if it's in front of them. We also work with a lot of collaborators all over the world, not just locally, but also internationally. We have friends in Germany, we have friends in Japan, Taiwan, Vienna, all over the place, and we get to visit and collaborate and talk with these people almost on a weekly basis. 
then of course we have to have funding for all of this research, and so we have a lot of fun funding from like Intel and things like that, and the Department of Defense, which after last night I guess that budget's going up, so maybe our research budget goes up. Uh, also the Department of Energy and the NSF, and so there's a lot of connections we can make while doing this research to really prepare us for an emerging market sector. All right, so none of that. Um, what we do is we do fundamental science research, and. Ugh, what's fundamental? And usually when I try to like explain this to somebody or somebody asks me that, I get a question something like this. Like, oh, you do your research, it's awesome, what do you do? And it's really hard to take what we do in a very tiny dungeon and bring that up to the real world. Um, but one of the ways that resonates with me is with fundamental research and fundamentals in general, if you master these, you can do very well at other things that require. And so this is my basketball coach from um, 10th grade, and I kid you not, that's actually him. And so he was always telling us, you got to master the fundamentals if you want to play basketball, right? you got to learn to dribble, you got to learn to pass, you got to learn to do all these things if you want to do the flashy stuff. And so we can kind of do the same thing, but our fundamentals are a little bit different. Our fundamentals are basic research. We do research on small-scale systems, idealized systems that are in vacuum, so there's no atmosphere. Things that have little real-world initial impact when they start off. And so what's the point of giving all this money to that, you might ask? And fundamental research is incredibly important because we don't know where these discoveries are going to go, and we don't know how powerful they're going to be when we first make them. For instance, if we can do the fundamentals, we can develop things that have significantly changed the way we look at the world. Everything from blue LEDs to efficient lighting in uh, economically stressed sectors of the world, to lasers letting us check out at supermarkets, G proteins and green fluorescent proteins, pretty much everything we know about human biochemistry in the last 20 years can be directly related to these things. And these are all built in small labs, idealized systems, in deep, dark dungeons before they make it out to the real world and really impact the way we live. Okay, so the fundamental science of media, though, is lasers and x-rays, right? So those seem like two kind of cool things. Is it really worth putting them together? Well, the visible laser definitely benefits society. We can do everything from laser eye surgery, we have micro-machine processes available, fiber optical communication, even the protection of fine art pieces in great movies by Oceans, or with Ocean's Eleven. X-ray light also benefits society. We've all been to the doctor, we've all been to the dentist, so we know that X-rays benefit in one way or another. And what we see here, this is William Rohan, who was the discoverer of X-rays back in the early 1900s, also won the first Nobel Prize ever for this. And this here is the first X-ray picture of um, his wife's left hand, further solidifying that whenever there is a great discovery, there's a strong woman behind it. The way he did this was with an X-ray tube, really just you heat up a filament with electrons, you send that into a little metal piece that shoots electrons everywhere, it's just like a light bulb. But with this, what we can do is we can see structures in the human body we never be able to see, and it develops some kind of sense of um, science fiction type ideas, like X-ray vision and things like that, being able to see through materials. And so, both these are good, um, but why do we need to combine them? What's the, what's the urgency here? What's the push for doing this? And uh, to explain this, I think I'll go to one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite analogies. Um, if you want to observe something or you want to see something, whatever you're looking at or whatever you're using to observe that has to be either faster or have faster pieces or smaller or smaller bits than what you're looking at. And so, in order to kind of bring this to reality, one of my favorite people on the planet, Kanye West, is going to help us out here for a second. Dude, he, he killed it. Yeah, Kanye was like, you can't show my face. Give it. Oh, man. Technical difficulties. Dude, I think he heard. Here we go. Okay. You got something walking around. Can you breathe? All right, everyone be nice to Kanye. He'll go away. All right, so anyways, if you see Kanye here, um... And we wanted to know information about Kanye, right? Like, that's pretty easy for our own eyes and our ears to do. For instance, the time scale of Kanye is like hours, minutes, seconds. He's a fairly large person, so that's like meters, millimeters we can feel around and kind of map him out. But maybe we want to know a little bit more, right? Maybe we want to know, why does Kanye smile? Why does Kanye frown? And to do that, we might look inside his head, and holy crap, we find neurons there, surprisingly. And if we look at these neurons, we'll find out is they're, they're doing things. They're firing. They're sending pulses. They're sending impulses down that's controlling the smile and the frowns. And these things are happening, well, a little bit quicker, actually. These things are happening on the scale of, like, this is a millisecond, here's several, like, tens of nanoseconds, and these things get faster and they get smaller and smaller. And if we look at these little light bundles that we're seeing here, we're like, well, maybe we're curious about what's going on there. What's causing those things to move? How are they moving? And if we look a little bit closer, we'll find there's actually microstructure and dynamics to this. We'll see there's things moving. There's smaller pieces to this. 
and they get even smaller and faster as we go down. And if we were to take an even closer look at this, we find out that these proteins are made up of even more proteins, which are made up of atoms, or which are made up of molecules and made up of atoms, which are move incredibly fast. We're talking billions of a billion, billions of a trillionth of a second, and size scales down to nanometers, picometers of the size of an atom. And so, I guess what I'm really trying to say here is, if we really want to understand what's going on inside Kanye's head, we're going to need X-rays and pictures. So. Why are these things good at this though? That's a big question, right? I just told you they were, why are they good at it? And it has to do with light in general being a good tool for this. It turns out it's one of the best tools for investigating nature in its own backyard. And it's because of all the properties of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so what we can see here is, um, this is the electromagnetic spectrum going from long wavelength, uh, low frequency, to very high frequency, very short wavelength, and a couple devices thrown in there. And it turns out that this little wiggly nature of these waves is incredibly powerful for being able to sense its own surroundings and be able to tell us information about light going through things. And so as an example, we'll focus on about three key areas here, I think. Radio waves, visible rays, and then of course X-rays we're gonna talk about. All right, and so here's an example plot of what all these waves look like. And they all look really kind of the same, not that much different, unless you look at the time on the bottom. And so what you can see here, there's, a, or, there's six orders of magnitude difference between the time scales here, and another, th uh, another three orders of magnitude, or a thousand times difference between the time scales here. So they wiggle really, really, really fast. And so radio waves are great because they're long wavelength, slow oscill they oscillate very slowly. They can see very big, very slow things, so whether it's weather radar or it's like clouds or any kind of um, penetrating imaging radar, these things are great for that. Visible waves are good, they have relatively shorter wavelengths, a little bit faster oscillations, so these things are good for like some kind of some more precise work. They can see kind of moderately small, sometimes kind of fast things. And then X-rays, they have even shorter wavelengths and they oscillate even faster. And so the shorter the wavelength, the smaller the object you can see, the faster they wiggle, the faster the process we can. So it's really that these things, by the way they oscillate, they can set the clock sort of of what we're going to be looking at. And so, Aside from that, we're going to exploit another one. I've been talking about strong lasers, ultra-intense lasers, and so that's the laser strength, that's the laser power. And this can tell us a lot about what's going on in nature. And the way this works is, uh, we'll go back to another analogy. Let's say, let's, go, let's think of um, the wolf and the three little pigs. Right, so I've got a wolf, I've got a house, I've got three little pigs, one of them doing a cartwheel. And if the wolf wants to blow this house down, he'll take a breath, he'll send it that way, but that won't do anything. Because that's just one little tiny breath. And the pigs will kind of laugh at it and be like, ah, come again, bro. But now let's say instead of one wolf, we could use many wolves, a thousand wolves, five for now. Uh, and they, we get them all to blow at the exact same time with the exact same strength. So that that will send into the house. That's a much bigger gust of wind. And that will blow the house away from the pigs. And now we can see what the pigs were doing inside of there. We can actually see where they're cooking, where they're cleaning, where they're playing piano. Now, that's a bit abstract, but. What we do is instead of wolves, we combine laser fields to create a very intense and a very short pulse of light. And so if we add all these laser fields up the right way and we add these waves together, we take something that's very initially kind of long, we squeeze it down in time. And if you think about energy or energy as being, or bleh, sorry, power as being energy over time, the shorter the time, the higher the power. And so instead of the pigs, we might be looking at atoms. Instead of the house, we're blowing away their electrons. All right, so first of all, I gotta tell you how we make a laser, right? This all sounds cool until I tell you if we can actually do it. And luckily, Einstein, uh, over a century ago, told us how to do this, laid down the math work for us. And so this is a picture of our laser in our lab down there. It's a bright, brilliant green. You might see a little bit of red there um, towards the end. And the way we make these lasers is we actually use a medium called titanium sapphire. And I think you guys want, brought some around the patch, you can look at it. Um, it's Sapphire, sapphire is actually clear, by the way. The heart of the ocean being blue is kind of some titanic crap. Um, but what makes this particular sapphire red is we put titanium ions in it. And those ions then get squeezed by the sapphire. And when they get squeezed by the sapphire, their electrons move change a little bit, and it actually changes the color. It changes the structure of these, or the energetic structure of these atoms. And so what we do is we take green light, that's the big green light that we're seeing, and we put energy into our laser medium. And so when we do that, you would only see green, and that's it. And then Einstein said, well, hey, you put this kind of light in, you should get red light out. But that didn't happen at first. And the reason that didn't happen is Einstein was kind of quiet on how we needed to do this the right way. 
And you actually can't just send light into a laser beam, that little crystal there, and have red light come out. A little bit will, but it won't be a big laser, and you can't amplify, you can't make it very strong. You need something with feedback. So we actually use all these mirrors in here to send the pulses back on themselves. And they're sort of circulating around, gaining energy as they go, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so when we do feedback, we can see that there's tons of red light in the cat. Or, sorry, in the laser. It's circulating around and it's slowly gaining it, not very slowly, but very quickly gaining the energy before we're actually going to use it. And so when we put it all together, we'll see the green and the reds again. And if we really want to get into the details of this, um, we can look at what's going on inside, on inside the, la uh, the laser medium. And so here's like three little ladders or levels that I've drawn to kind of represent the energy available on our laser. So the first step is we have to send green light in to take electrons from the titanium atoms and pump them, give them energy. Because we want to take that energy from them because we're just mean like that. Then we usually have an intermediate step somewhere in there that kind of helps balance things out and helps us collect all the electrons there. Because remember, we want a giant pulse. And so if we want a lot of light coming out, we need a lot of electrons to help us get that energy and light out. And then finally, in the third step, these electrons will jump back down to where they were and that will emit the light out. And so another way of looking at this is, for instance, these electrons going up here are getting energy from our pump laser. That's the green laser. And so that energy is the difference between the two level, these two levels. They're losing a little bit here, so we can kind of collect them and you know keep a good like number of them up there. And then the last step, that's the color of our laser. That's just the energy that's emitted when these electrons come back down. They just throw out a little, a little light pulse. OK, now it's not the fun part. We have to talk discussion questions. All right, so let's look back at this energy level diagram again to see if we can build a laser in, I don't know, the two minutes that we have. So once again, remember that we're going, we're jumping in energy levels one, two, three here, and that these, the difference in levels correspond to different things. They correspond to the energies of these lasers. So I'm going to take that away now because I'm meeting and ask a question. So let's say we have a laser medium that is blue in color. Can you relabel the energy diagram with appropriate colors to tell me what, we should, what kind of light we should put in, what kind of light will come out? Also, a little bit more to read there, um, but if once you get the colors figured out, can you tell me which laser emits light faster? Ours, which uses the red crystal that's being passed around, or this new blue one? And I'll give you a few hints while I'll discuss about this. All right, I'm sorry, enough suffering. All right, the grand prize of why me thinking you're awesome. Number one, give me some colors. Three to one is blue. Three to one is blue. Okay, nice. What? Does anyone know why it's blue? There you go, because that's the color of the crystal. Okay. Ah, oh, you can just shout at me. I'm just like, oh. Um, all right. What about one to two? What color should that be? Yeah, purplish. Violet, maybe something we don't see. Even. Yeah. Uh, number two. Which one's a faster laser or emits light faster? The little red one that I passed around or our new blue laser? Blue. 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 My temptation is to say blue, but I don't think you've tried the purple. I think you define faster. The same. So faster is just, it's based on how quickly the electrons leave. So another way of asking this question, what's more energetic? The blue laser or the red laser? The blue laser. Okay, cool. Yep, there we go. Oh, I guess we can't see it. It's purple. Sorry. Um, so yeah, okay. So now, how, um, how do we make these lasers? So now that we know how to make a laser, how is our laser different than the ones that you're used to? And how is it different than a laser pointer? And most of the lasers that we see in day-to-day -day life are what we call continuous wave lasers. They emit a beam of laser light, and it's always on. It's always oscillating from the moment you turn it on to the moment you turn it off. And these things are really nice, right, because we use them all the time. They have precise frequencies and wavelengths. We can make them pretty high power on average. They're really easy to make, and they last forever. You've never really heard of like a shortage of stock market laser scanners or something like that. Now, we work with ultra-fast lasers, and so these guys work, they emit light in extremely short, extremely <coughs> intense pulses, or what I like to call them is light pancakes. And so instead of being always on, they shoot out individual little pulses that only last for a billionth of a billionth of a second. And even though the laser looks red, it's actually off more than it's on which is kind of crazy to think about, our eyes just can't catch up. Because the distance, or the time between these pulses for the biggest lasers in the world, it can be days, 
they can only fire once every so often, or they can fire really, really quickly a million times a second, like some of the lasers in our lab. And we can play games to mess with how thin or thick the pancakes are, and we can scale this down from nanoseconds, those are like those proteins walking around in Kanye's head, to femtoseconds, which are billi trillions of a billionth of a second, which is the atoms that are kind of controlling the, the large behavior that's emerging out of Kanye. So it's not as small. Um, these things are nice too because they have many frequencies and wavelengths in them. So if we have a material that responds to many frequencies and wavelengths at once, then we can use knowledge press lasers to study them all at once. They have very high intensity. They flash on only very briefly, so we can be very like it's a very short perturbation of the system. But they're much more complicated um, to design. And so yeah, so I keep talking about strong lasers. You might ask like, what, why do you keep calling these strong lasers and stuff like that? And is it really that big? And yeah, it's a very strong laser. It's a very big laser. And the reason for this is, oh, hey, Rock. Um, it actually takes three lasers to run our one laser. We use a miniature laser, which I'll call an oscillator. And actually, these little green spikes there, you can't see them. Those are our individual laser pulses kind of going about. We have a second laser, that's the big green laser, that just puts an energy to the third laser so it can steal it away. We don't even use that laser for anything else except stealing its energy away. So now, I have the rock will go away because we proved it's strong. And yeah, we actually have a miniature version. If you remember a few slides ago from over here, we have a miniature version of this big laser hiding inside that one. So I think in total, there's actually one, two, three, four lasers that get our one laser working. All right, so that's how we make a really big strong laser. How do we make an X-ray laser, right? This sounds kind of cool. Like, so, oh, shit, Einstein again. What do you know? He actually told us how to do this. That's crazy. Uh, a little bit older, though, maybe a little bit more grumpy bad news coming. Turns out it's very difficult to make an x-ray laser. Extremely difficult. For good reasons. If we go back to that energy level diagram we saw before, what I, I kind of lied to you. What I didn't tell you was that there are other pathways from this energy level other than just going back down. And it turns out these pathways are really, really good at stealing energy away from these laser crystals. And in fact, they're so good that if we think about the amount of energy that's lost this way compared to the one that we want, there's an unfavorable scaling with wavelength. Um, so it goes to the inverse third power. And so what this means is that's, that's on the denominator, right? So the smaller the wavelength, the bigger this number gets. So the more bad, no lazy energetic pathways happen compared to the ones we want to lace as we scale the wavelength down. Even worse, the required power to get a laser to actually emit light scales worse with the wavelength. It scales to the negative fifth. And so we have to put a tremendous amount of power into this if we even want to make an X-ray laser. And uh, oh yeah, the little fishy thing, that just means proportional too, and whatnot. Um, but it's not the first time people have thought about this. Back in the 80s, Reagan started a program called SDI, it was a Strategic Defense Initiative. They wanted to put lasers in space to shoot down nukes and stuff like that. These things were huge. The power that they wanted to put into that, the, the proposed mechanism was detonating a nuke inside a laser. So they would detonate a nuke, somehow control that, and then that would just shoot a laser out and blow up another um, this is the Cold War. Uh, but and then we also actually have X-ray lasers, um, but not the way the same. Not exactly. But they don't work in the same way. And uh, although these exist and they're nice, they're they're huge. They're massive. This one is one of the latest ones that's been developed. It's in Hamburg in Germany. And uh, what you can't see from the map is Hamburg is actually like right over here. This is the next village. And so this is about three to five kilometers that this machine has to be built just to make an X-ray laser. And because it's so big, only one group can use it at a, at a time. Our goal is to take this, scale it down to a university scale so we can work on it in a dungeon and we never have to leave it. Okay, another discussion question. So, laser we use in our lab, it's pretty powerful. It takes 40 watts of green energy to make our laser work. All right, and that's 800 nanometers in wavelength. Using 800 nanometers in wavelength, can you estimate how much power it would take to make an X-ray laser that's one nanometer in wavelength. And just to remind you, it was power is proportional to the wavelength to the inverse fit path. So what you think about that? Go ahead and compare that value to the average energy consumption the US uses in an hour. And then when you're done, I'll tell you some other fun energy numbers. Hi, we have to do Alright, anyone got a number by chance? Throw it out, how big is it for how small? 10 to the 9th? 10 to the 14th. That's the one. 10 to the 14th. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. Don't worry, math is super hard. That's why I don't do it anymore. I just work with lasers. So, yeah, 10 to the 14th. 
That's a hundred, what is, what is that? Is that a hundred million million? hundred trillion? I think, right? That's how we can say that, something like that. hundred trillion watts, right? The U.S. in one hour uses about a hundred times less than that. So if we want to make an X-ray laser just fire one little laser pulse, we have to take the entire U.S. for a hundred hours and throw all that energy into our laser. Now, some other alternatives maybe? The average power released by a class three hurricane is actually more than it takes to make an X-ray laser, which is kind of insane to think about. Um, the average power produced by your human body is about 100 watts. Um, you can convert that into time and figure out your calories and stuff like that, so we're kind of like light bulbs. Um, and then the average power of like a, I don't know, a new sedan or something like that, that's several hundred thousand watts. So the, the, the energy scales we're talking about here are global energy scales, astronomical energy scales. So how do we beat that, right? Like we can't, we can't power something like this. And what we do is we use a technique called high harmonic generation. So we, we're gonna convert our visible laser light directly into x-rays, just like currency exchange. Except it's not as like unstable as Bitcoin. So what we'll do is gosh, that's relevant. Um, so yeah, we'll take a femtosecond laser pulse and we'll focus it into a gas with a high intensity. And what that's going to do is just like removing the house from the three little pigs, that's going to rip electrons off of the atom. And when it does that, these electrons can actually be accelerated by the laser field. They're charged particles. They can feel the force of the laser, and they can gain energy from it. And when they gain energy from it, there's a chance that they might find their way back home again. But when they find their way back home again, the laws of nature dictate that, that energy has to go somewhere. And so instead of going to the atom, it emits an X-ray photon. And so what this might look like if we could be the size of an atom, is we see that there's an atom with its little electrons swirling around and stuff like that, and on a really, really short time scale. And if we wait a little bit, oh, there we go, we put our laser pulse in, the electrons will get ionized, they'll fly away, they might come back, and when they do, they'll emit X-ray pulses. And we do this many times. Every laser pulse that comes in, knocks the electrons out, they come back, they emit x-rays. Once again, just because it's fun, electrons go out, electrons come back, and they emit x-rays. And so we do this with every laser pulse. And this is how we take our big laser that sits on a table and we make a little, little tiny version of an x-ray laser. And so when we do that, we can do some really interesting stuff. Things that, like I said, sound straight out of science fiction. We can do like some na things like nanoscale imaging. We can see smaller than any microscope can possibly see on the planet right now. We can look at transport of individual electrons, how atoms are moving in solids, how that solid is evolving to heat stresses, like if we're downloading something on our phone and our phone heats up, or we just, I don't know, have it like a Note 7. Um, we can see charge and energy flow in molecular nanosystems, so we can watch sunlight be absorbed by a material and watch that charge and energy get transferred until it powers something. Turns out, nobody really knows how magnets work. Um, if anyone tells you they do, really don't know how they work despite being around for a while. And so we can study magnets because they're pretty important for a lot of things. And then we can also look at how electrons talk to each other in materials. How do they feel their neighbors? How do they get out of their material if they need to? And so one of the main pushes for this is um, in the internal quest to make devices smaller and smaller and smaller, nanotechnology has actually outpaced itself. It has gotten to the point where we can manufacture devices that are so small, we can't look at them quick enough to do proper diagnostics. And this is a huge problem because it turns out one of the fastest ways to figure out if you make a nanoscale device, a new transistor, you make a new chip, the fastest way to figure out if it's messed up or it's not going to work is to just put it in the computer and see if it works, which wastes a lot of time. And one of the key examples of this, you can think about this, if you remember from the Samsung was Note 7, those battery explosions that they were having, this is how they were trying to figure it out. They can't see inside of these things small enough and fast enough, so they just plug them all in and let them charge up. I figure out when they blow up. And punchline of the story, it actually took an X-ray laser to figure it out. They had to take it to one of those big lasers in Hummer and actually try to figure out what was causing the batteries to blow up. So what we need, we can like look at these things faster and more reliably than the techniques that we have. And the way we do that is, this really is an X-ray emission, using the X-rays to see small. And before we do that, we have to think about how do X-rays help us see small? Why are X-rays so good at this? And we'll make another analogy to kind of bring this um, to light here. And we'll make an analogy to painting. And so this is Sunday afternoon on the island of uh, Grandiette, I think. Um, I'm not going to speak good French, but I've uh, gone, was it? Ah, thank you. Can you say it? George, is it super? Dang, it's so good. All right. I don't know how I'm going to follow that. Uh, anyway, so this is a really pretty painting. And uh, this is a pointillism painting. And so in pointillism, every single, there's no brush strokes, it's just brush dots that make it. And so if you use a slightly bigger or slightly smaller brush, you'll get a much more finer paint and a much better image, much better resolution than you did if you use a fat brush or a big brush. 
And so we don't have brushes, right? We have x-rays, we, we have lasers. And so instead of brushes, we use wavelength. Small wavelength sees smaller structures. Larger wavelengths, we see larger structures. And of course, the credit for this analogy goes to our wonderful organizer. Just want to shout out for that guy. Um, and so how do we do this? Send x-rays onto a particular sample. This one is a little bit interesting. It's actually like a, an alloy sample with many layers to it. Sometimes when they make new devices, you have to put down a base layer, and then there's more layers that go on top to actually get the properties that you want. But an even worse problem, you can't see the top layer. How do you even see the bottom layers? How do you know you didn't mess one up by putting that sandwich together? And so conventional techniques here at MNSEM, that we don't need to worry about, they're very destructive and they take a lot of time. Uh, you have to line things very carefully, you have to put stuff in the vacuum, and they end up destroying the sample. So if your sample's messed up, like, oh crap, you destroyed it doing it anyways. But if we can shine the x-rays in just the right way and collect the light that's reflected off, the image that we can get is just as good, if not even better, than the most advanced technologies out there, and it's much, much quicker. And it can be done in a rapid process. You don't have to like, change out samples that take forever. And most of all, it's not destructive, unlike these other techniques. And so by using the x-rays, we can do a lot of things. We can see through opaque materials, peer through aluminum. We can peer through other kinds of metals. We can distinguish between different materials. Because remember when I was talking about how light is kind of interacting with the material it goes through? If it interacts differently with aluminum or copper, titanium, or something like that, then well, we can see that. And all this is combined with the ability to see things down to tens of nanometers, 10,000 times smaller than the width of a human hair. And because of that, Superman's going to be out of a job with his x-ray vision. We're actually doing a little bit better. All right, so now we're on to uh, something that uh, I have a little bit more of that I work with. And what I do is caveman science. Um, it's easy to understand. It's the only thing I can do. And so the question is, if you're a caveman and you want to find out what's inside of a rock, what would you do? Break the yeah, smash it and pick up the pieces. That's exactly what we do in our lab. We just do it a little bit more sophisticated. And if we take, if you break those rocks apart, you never know, you might find something a little bit more interesting inside. And so that's our goal here. We're going to blow stuff up, pick up the pieces, and see what we can do with it. So what cracks our rocks? Um, and what we use is we use this device here. This is called a photoelectron spectrometer. It's a big fancy name. But the goal of this thing is, once we zoom in and kind of cut away on some of this stuff, is we're going to introduce some kind of sample, a molecule, a nanoparticle, uh, maybe it's an atom, something interesting we want to study the interaction of light. And then we'll send a giant laser pulse in and blow it up. You'll see all those little bits, those little yellow bits, those are electrons, those are ions, those are pieces of whatever was there before we initiated all this carnage, and we'll collect it at the top, pick up all the pieces. And as counterintuitive as this sounds, if you know enough about what you're doing when you're blowing this thing up, you can actually piece back together what was happening right before you blew it up from the pieces. It's kind of like destroying a Lego set and building it back together again. And so, one of the ways we do this is this is just kind of a cartoonish version of what we had seen before. We're here, I'm going to introduce some nanoparticles or molecules, and we'll blow them up with, let's just say, a red and a blue laser this time, and we'll collect the carnage and see what kind of happens. And so we want to look at what's going on inside of here. Um, we want to look at fast processes. We want to look at what's going on. And these light fields allow us to look at these processes in real time. I'm actually going to, we're going to see what an electric field looks like. And so if we look right here where the lasers are overlapped. Here's my red laser, here's my blue laser. And you'll notice this little, the combination of the two is a little funny. It doesn't look quite like the symmetric wave. There's like peaks and troughs to it. And if we slide one of these laser wavelengths past another, and the way we do that is we just jiggle a little mirror to make it move past each other, we change the shape of this in time. And what that allows us to do is make really interesting movies where we can see the electrons that we're blowing up and they're oscillating back and forth back and forth with this field. And so we do this mainly for a diagnostic check, but it always blows my mind because what we're seeing in real time is we're seeing electric fields. We're seeing things that oscillate on femtosecond time scales, billions of billions of seconds, and we're seeing things that exist on nanometer length scales, smaller than any biological constituent in your body. And it looks kind of like a spider, so I guess it's kind of neat. Uh, so how do we do this more sophisticated? Like, that's kind of neat, but let's do a real world application of this. Um, and so one of the things we look at, we look at nanomaterials, we look at these things like quantum materials, the funny things called quantum dots. And we do kind of the same thing, we just shine laser light in between these little plates here, we blow stuff up, we collect the pieces, and then we try to figure out what's going on with it. And you might wonder, like, oh, why do I care about quantum dots, dude? Well, I don't even know what that is, that doesn't sound interesting at all. But they have these really interesting uh, light properties. 
colors. They can emit very pure colors, very saturated, very bright colors. And you may think this is kind of unrelated to you, but Samsung just put out a TV that uses this technology building on results much like this. After 20 years of work, we were able to figure out how the energetics of these things work better than LEDs. And now this QLED TV is actually, it's an array of LEDs that excite quantum dots. And it produces the most vivid color that we've ever been able to produce as human beings, rivaling our own vision. All right. And so, kind of to wrap this up, I promised that we would be able to watch electrons in real time, be able to see how they talk to their neighbors, be able to see like how they feel around their neighbors, whether they hate them or not. And so, in these type of studies, we'll shine our high harmonic generation, our X-ray light, onto a material, and we'll blow that up too, and send the electrons away. That's kind of the trend here. And what we want to know is we want to know what are the electrons doing in there, and that's kind of like trying to not just find where Waldo is, but what the hell is Waldo doing in there too? So we're asking two very hard questions because electrons are well, a little bit smaller than Waldo, I think. But if we do this just right, we can find out really interesting stuff. We can find out how long, for instance, it takes these electrons to interact with each other. Here, that looks like as. That's actually out of seconds. This is billions of a billionth of a billionth of a second, so even faster than some of the stuff I've been talking about. And we find that they, they take time to talk to each other. They take time to get out of the material. They take time to move around. And we can also find out what kind of interactions they sort of have with each other, right? Like, how are they? Are they repelling each other? Are they sticking together? Do they come out in twos? What are, are they lone wolves? And so, yeah, so a lot of that is pretty high level. A lot of it is kind of fun stuff to look at and stuff. But um, where's the future going? Because we should always be thinking about the future when we're doing research. And, so all this is cool, got a lot of lasers, but what's next? Um, one of the more exciting projects, I think, is uh, these super duper awesome low intense lasers that we're going to be building soon. And this is being built in Europe right now. It's a huge laser facility in many countries involved. What they want to do is they want to create light so intense, it rips vacuum apart. So vacuum has nothing in it, supposedly, right, for a, 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 at a topical level. Um, and these lasers can be so intense, they can spontaneously create antimatter. Right there. So it's rivaling conditions of the Big Bang. You can study some of these galactic, like cosmological processes. And it's already being built. It's going to be commissioned in the next two or three years. Um, what about faster than the crap I've been talking about? Billions of a billion of a billion of a billion of a second, something like that. And yeah, so the fastest light pulses we have now, we can kind of watch electrons move around atoms. But what if we want to watch something else? I didn't talk about nuclei, right? I didn't talk about protons or anything like that. I kind of swept those under the rug. And it's because they move even faster. For instance, the Higgs boson. That's its lifetime, its interaction time is 10 to the minus 22 seconds, and I'm not going to waste your time counting billions there. We have, we have no light yet. So how do we catch up with it? Maybe we use a gamma ray laser, maybe something more intense. Maybe we need something like a black hole or something like that to give us enough energy to do it. Um, but that leads me to my next point, and uh, it's kind of a concluding remark. But what's the best part about research? And the best part about research is we never know the next direction. We're constantly in the lab trying to discuss things, trying to figure out, we're like, okay, should we go this way, should we go that way, should we try this? And we really don't know. And it sounds kind of intimidating, but it's, it's so much fun, because if you don't know, well, you're more comfortable being wrong, because no one else knows. And we never know where a discoverer's gonna go. Sometimes it's one little minus sign, sometimes it's one little equation, a petri dish let down sitting in open air that cures smallpox. We never know. And so, maybe something cooler, maybe something better than X-ray lasers is gonna come around and solve some of these problems, but, um, yeah, I don't know, there are a so I doubt that. All right, and with that, um, I'll thank everyone for kind of sticking around on a uh, Wednesday night and listening to uh, some really excited person talk about physics and stuff like that. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to ask them. So good, Kevin. I think we, we have some time for questions, if anybody has some. Uh, the, uh, the, the hidden answer there is I only put three rungs on the ladder. There can be many, many, many more rungs on the ladder. And sometimes the laser medium you can't even see. Uh, for instance, that was solid. Uh, another class, the laser isomers lasers. Those are what's called excimer lasers, and they use gas of like argon and krypton and stuff mixed together. It's very transparent. And so it's all about how these energy levels stack up. So for solid state materials like what I passed around, for the most part, that's the color you're going to see coming out. But no, certainly not. Fun fact, eye surgery was invented on accident for those who don't know.
a researcher in Michigan uh, got shot in the eye with a laser, and then when they took him to the doctor, the eye doctor was like, hey, why'd you cut your eye like that, man? That's like the best like corneal cut I've ever seen in my life. And I don't know, they kind of told him in secret, and then, yeah, laser eyes are Oh yeah. Never. I don't think we ever answered the second question. Oh, oh, God, which one? Which one missed like faster? Yes. Um. So yeah. So in that case, there's um a relationship between, and we can actually go back only a few slides for this. There's a relationship between the energy that a system has and the time it takes for that system to evolve or to do something. The Higgs boson is incredibly energetic. It's like one of the most energetic particles we've ever measured. And so it lasts for a very short amount of time. It's kind of like drinking a bunch of coffee and being cracked out, but you're only going to make it like another five to 10 minutes. And so when an energy level is very high, it gets rid of that energy very, very quickly. When the energy is very low, it gets rid of that energy much, much slower because it's much more stable and more favorable to do that. And so, yeah, so when I say um, I don't mean it's, uh, it shoots the bullets out faster or anything like that, I just mean that the light that comes out comes out faster compared to another one because it takes more energy to put into that blue laser than it did the red one. Does that kind of pick things up a little bit? Or? Okay, yeah. So there's something on this slide that was the Schwinger limit, which was about like the antimatter. How, how much does that relate to like the amount of until there's enough energy density to just like form black hole? Oh, I actually don't know how much energy. Density it takes. This is where you get me because I wasn't a fifth on our physics. <laughs> uh, does anyone know anyone taking a shot or anything like that? Would any can ball part of this? <laughs> I have no I have no idea. Um, the issue one of the fundamental issues here though is we would never make a black hole um, because there's no mass in this part. Well there's not enough mass in this part. So you don't just need energy for a black hole, you need a lot of mass too, and a lot of density to it. And even though we could rip back in the part, we never create enough matter to have such an interaction that it would stick together and sink heavily enough to create a micro black hole. Although, I don't mean. Is that, is that, did that clear things up or? fluctuations to it and things like that and so when we shine the uh, laser that intense and it rips apart vacuum to create antiparticle or um, antimatter really positrons and electrons it does so because there's fluctuations to vacuum it's never really intense um, and so I just say vacuum because I'm too dumb to understand things like that but in a way it seems like creating something out of nothing but you're not creating something out of nothing there's always a little bit of something does that, does that help or Okay. Uh, so, on that note, Kevin, do you mind hanging out for a little while in case people have more questions? Great. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, before I let you all go, just a couple of quick announcements, reminders. One is we have these four computers in the back of the room. We ask people to uh, sign into these talks. This is how we are able to show the department that people show up here. This is how we're able to buy the pizza and keep that moving. So, it helps us a lot. It only takes like 15 seconds if you haven't done it already. Please grab some pizza on your way out. I don't want to deal with it. Um, and we have our next talk in two weeks. It's going to be a great talk about nuclear physics and the quark gluon plasma. So uh, before you go, let's thank Kevin one more time. And thank you so much for coming. We'll see you in two weeks.